So I want to talk to you today about being adopted by God. Um, if you're new today or just uh, coming for the first time, I've been doing a series I started in the book of Ephesians a couple of weeks ago called The Glory of Christ in His Church. But today's message is being adopted by God. Last week I talked about the believer's blessings in Christ. I'll just mention that for a minute today before I get into this subject of adoption. And I'll be looking out of Ephesians chapter 1, the first few verses there today. And as I've shared, this book of Ephesians I think is very, very important, what the Lord's put on my heart uh, to, to share at this time. I believe it's something that gives us a higher view of Jesus and his church. How many know it's all about Jesus? And it's all about his church, right? Now, that may surprise some of you, but do you realize as an individual believer, you're not just justified by your faith in Christ and what Christ has done for you, but you're part of the body of Christ, the capital C church, the eternal church, right, that Jesus loves dearly. Do you realize he loves the church? Now, I know, as I've shared the last couple of weeks, no church is perfect. We're not perfect. No church is perfect. That said, from eternity, Jesus sees his church as glorious and perfect. Do you believe that? That's important. Because Jesus, if we begin to live out of our identity individually, realizing that we're loved, accepted, and forgiven by the Father, and then we realize as a church body, again, we have room to improve, but we realize we're loved and accepted by the Father, and all of a sudden we begin to carry an attitude. Wait a minute. We are already seen as glorious in Christ, yet we're becoming more and more like Him right? Now we can begin to influence our world because we're confident the Father's for us and not against us. You realize that? Now, as I caution, this is not something that we get puffed up individually or certainly as church bodies. No, we're to walk in love and humility, right? It's not about we're going to take over the world or something like that. No, we influence people with the light and love of the Father shining through us because there's a world out there groping in darkness looking for answers. Have you noticed that, right? And we are the answer. The church is the answer, and Jesus is shining brightly through us. And so um, just let me give you a little backdrop. You know, to understand Paul's writing, again, Paul wrote Ephesians and, and some of these letters while he was in prison, as I've shared these last few weeks. But his perspective of the church, we need to understand uh, his revelation of the gospel. For Paul, his revelation of the gospel revolved around our identification in Christ that I just mentioned. Also, around Christ's substitutionary sacrifice for us and his ministry at the right hand of the Father. These are all aspects of the mystery of Christ that Paul writes about. And Paul was given this deeper understanding of Christ in us and us in Christ. The two are synonymous. Our union with Christ. Some have called it the finished work of Christ. Many of the early apostles walked with, with Christ, and they had this understanding of Christ's work for us. But they didn't quite have this understanding to the depth that Paul did of Christ in us. Jesus did do something for us. He revealed the Father. Everything that he did revealed the love of the Father towards you and I. That death on the cross, that vicarious death on the cross and the shedding of his blood for the atonement of our sin, for the healing of our bodies, for our restoration. And his raising from the dead is all to reconcile us to the Father. Absolutely. That's what he did for us. But now something is happening because of our walk with him and putting our faith in him. He's doing something in us because of our union with him that is more than just what he did for us. Does this make sense? And because he's doing something in us, we can then rely on him to allow him to flow through us to do something out there. Amen? You realize when you pray for someone, those are not just empty words. The Christ in you, Jesus in you, the Spirit of God in you and upon you is working in you a far greater and exceeding weight of glory. This is what he's doing. And so we impact our world with the light and the love of Christ. Our union with Christ is foundational for understanding our justification and sonship. It's also for the church as well. Both the believer and the church are already perfected, yet progressively becoming more like Christ. Again, through Paul's writings, you, you get this theme. 
The church is the very fullness of Christ. I'll read a scripture in a moment. And dearly loved by Jesus, he gave us his life for you and I that we might become part of God's eternal church, God's eternal family. And Paul uses throughout his writings, not just in Ephesians, but in other places, he uses the metaphor of a human body to illustrate how united we are to Christ and to each other. He's the head and we comprise the body. And we're different members and all of us have a different part and place in the body of Christ. That's those who have gone on before us, those of us who are now presently, and those who will come after us. Does this make sense? And so when we believe this and we walk in this truth, we then begin to walk confidently as the light of the world and radiate God's love and glory to those without Christ. Again, this is why Jesus in the Gospels and Paul and the other New Testament writers stress the importance of unity in our church relationships because we are his body. I'm going to develop, develop this more in a minute. And uh, unity is related to the very glory of Christ shining through the church. Now let's read out of Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm just going to read down through verse 6 today, verses 3 through 6, because I want to really get into this subject of being adopted by God. Um, All praise to God, reading out of the New Living Translation, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. I spent quite a bit of time talking about that last week, and so I'll just touch it for a minute today, but go back and watch it if you, if you can. He goes on to say, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. And I'll stop there for today. And so Ephesians 1.3, again, as I shared last week, he talks about how we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. And so we worship God. We even sang about it today. We worship God in response to his blessings upon us. And so I asked this question last week, how much blessing is every spiritual blessing? How deep and how wide are the riches of Christ? Both now and through eternity. And Christ is the fullness of God in bodily form. Colossians 1.19 talks about this. And we, the church, are the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 1.22 and 23. Let me read that. Paul says, God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head of everything in the church, which is, body, which is his body. His body, the church, is the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. And so, Jesus is the fullness of God and the fullness of all creation, if you will. And we, the church, are literally the fullness of Christ. Now, again, this is the capital C church. This is the eternal church throughout the ages. But this is how God sees us, and this is how we should see one another. Now, again, we walk in love. We walk in humility. We don't get puffed up. It's not about us taking over, you know, in some areas of government or whatever. No, no, no. We influence through love. We influence through the, being the light and the glory of Christ. And the world then begins to notice how wonderful, how amazing Jesus is. And all of a sudden, he becomes something desired. Do you realize the church should be the most irresistible force on earth? Amen. Why? Because Christ, who fills all and is all, is in the church. He is the head of the church, who fills the church. And so if we allow Jesus to be Jesus in us and through the church, we become attractional beyond anything that the world could ever offer. Now, I'm looking forward to watching the Green Bay Packers tonight play the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> Interest of full disclosure. But there is not a football game on earth that holds a candle to the church who is fully alive and fully ablaze with Jesus Christ. Come on. When he is the reason we live and move and have our being, all of a sudden, wow, 
Katie, bar the doors. They, <laughs> man, they'll be lining up to get in our churches. Christ is the fullness of God, and we, the church, are the fullness of Christ. In other words, all that pertains to life and godliness are found in Christ, and Christ is in us, and he is the fullness of every spiritual blessing. You feel like you're running on empty? You need more of God? You feel like, you know, things need to shift in your life? You feel the bank accounts? Right? Listen, tap into him. Jesus, you are the fullness of everything. And you are in me. You are in the church. Lord, I am one with you. Lord, you see this situation. I just, just begin to praise him for the answer before you ever see it. God, I thank you. That answer is on its way. The blessing is on. Lord, that which I have need of, you said you know everything that I have need of before I ask it or even think it. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You know it all together, God. You created me. Come on. And notice now Paul also says in this verse 3, he says, In the heavenly realms, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. This is so beautiful. And again, I'll just touch on it quickly. I really got into it last week. Paul is contrasting the powers who would enslave them versus Jesus who is in the heavenlies, is head over all uh, spirit powers for his church. And by the way, I don't care what tra transpires the next couple of days. You know what happens this time of the year. Listen, just pray and declare the blood of Christ over your home, over your family, over the church. Listen, over our city. Listen, demonic powers have nothing. They're already defeated, right? Jesus is the reigning king. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We, re we love people. We realize they're swayed by the powers of darkness. We want to see them get free. I want every drug dealer, every gang leader, I want all that fentanyl rooted out of this area. But I know it's the battle that's going to be won in the spirit realm. As the church goes to prayer on her knees and says, okay, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Jesus, I thank you, you're greater. That 29th Street quarter, no more fentanyl, no more drugs. And we begin to pray, we begin to witness, we begin to reach out and we say, okay, come on church, let's keep going after this. What the enemies meant harm, for harm, God's going to turn for good. Come on, church. Paul was referencing in this passage here, Psalm 23, 5. Remember that? The psalmist said, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Do you realize this is why having a church like ours right here in the center of town is, oh, it's exactly what God wants. We want to put a table right out there in the lawn. We're going to do that today. Have a hot dog, whatever, right? Right in the presence of darkness, not that everybody around us is dark, many wonderful Christians, right? Listen, but right in the presence where the enemy would try to just ransack an area, God says, no, 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 my church, my son is in her. The light and the glory of the gospel of Christ is shining under them. They may not realize it just yet. Keep praying, church, they'll turn. Listen, the shepherd would go through the pasture and remove all poisonous weeds placing them high on a rock, too high to reach. Jesus has gone before us, preparing our way, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, Colossians 2.15. Christ has triumphed over all principalities and powers and has broken the power of the enemy over our lives. And if he's broken it over our lives, we can enforce his victory, not only over our church, our property, but we can enforce it over a realm of a city. And when churches begin to awaken to that reality, all of a sudden things begin to shake. And this is what you want to talk about revival, just look through history. When, that, when churches begin to realize, and it doesn't mean that all of us have to be in unity, you get enough people. In fact, most revivals and awakenings start, start with about 12 or a few or less people. When people begin to realize, wait a minute, there's enough firepower in us because Christ is in us. We begin to pray, we're going to make a difference. God's going to come and invade this place. Listen, God cares for your needs in the midst of evil forces that attempt to destroy your life and soul. The key is learning how to walk in his victory in the conflicts that we all face. Remember, the Spirit is the agent to release the blessings. They are appropriated by our faith, and faith is that currency of heaven Many want God's blessings but haven't responded in faith to appropriate what God has freely given us through Christ. Salvation, healing, deliverance, provision, breakthrough. We must live from heaven 
toward earth from our standing in Christ, who's seated far above all powers and principalities. Ephesians 2, 6, Paul says, we've been seated together in the heavenly places in Christ. We pray from heaven towards earth. We pray from his victory here. We let Christ in us enforce and walk out what he's already done for us. Does this make sense? Every area of your life, every area for our cities, for our nation. All right, let's talk about being adopted by God. We've been chosen in Christ to be part of God's family. Let me read verses 4 through 6 again of Ephesians 1. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we please God, we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Now think about this. Before God created the world, man, or humanity, who was in the heart and mind of God, was chosen to be part of God's family, like him, holy and without fault. Notice verse 5. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. God, through Jesus, brings us into his family and it gives him pleasure. Everything that we have in Christ is a gift of God's grace, and we praise him for this glorious grace that he's poured out. Now, in chapter 2, we'll get to that here in a few weeks, Paul reminds the reader that we were dead in sins, but God reached down through Christ in grace and made us alive. Through Christ, all of humanity can receive this grace. It's not restricted to a certain few. Listen to this. It is not restricted to a certain few predestined to salvation. It's not what Paul's talking about here. I like what pastor and author Mark Holmes says. He goes, the plan was determined, the plan, that's, listen, the plan was determined by the Father before the creation of the world, and yet its fulfillment came through, his, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His cry from the cross, it is finished, John 19.30, was a statement uh, revealing the completion of the events necessary to satisfy God's great provision. It's a plan that God put in place. God's predetermination emphasizes the plan of salvation and not the individual. Too many have looked at this as God's already predetermined who will be saved and who will not be saved. No, no, no. God predetermined a plan that through Jesus Christ, salvation could be made available to all people. Does it make sense? God is not willing that any would perish but that all would come to repentance. God set this glorious plan in place. Does God know the end from the beginning? Absolutely. Does God know who will be saved and who? Yes. But does not mean that God gives us free will? He gives us free choice. You can choose today to walk with God or not walk with God. It's not already been predetermined what you will do. i got to drive this home. Because there are some theological bents in the body of Christ. Says, no, 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 no. It's already been determined who will be saved. So we don't need to even evangelize because at the right time, they'll just come to Christ. No, 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 no. Jesus, in the heart and mind of God, co-equal with the Father, the Father said, okay, in the fullness of time, I'll send you, Son, to earth to come in human flesh, to walk among men, to die on a cross. He goes, because I want my church, my family, I want them to, to have the fullness of everything that we have. I want that for them. God already knew, and it's available to everyone, but not everyone chooses that which is available freely. I've been in meetings all over the world for many, many years here in America abroad. I've watched people, I've watched people say yes to Christ. The, le the least likely, the least suspecting, all of a sudden the Spirit of God touches them, their minds are awakened, and they say yes to Christ, and a boom, the tears are streaming, and they say yes, they give their life to Christ. I've watched others, some sit in the church for years, and they sit there like this. If you got your arms crossed, I'm not looking at you, okay? <laughs> Boy, what I'm talking about is an inner attitude of the heart. You see, it's not a little bit of Jesus that'll do you. It's, it's not a little bit of your mother's faith that's going to get you through. It's when you realize that there was a plan by the Father to adopt you into his family. I'm just going to say it because I was one. I came out of it. The rascal that you are. I'm not looking at anybody. 
But aren't you glad that he reached down? God so loved us that he gave his son. Paul said this in Romans 5, that God demonstrated his own love towards us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. He made a plan. He made a way. It's through Jesus. And so this is so beautiful. So God's plan for all humanity is to know of him. We aren't merely chosen for our own sake, but for a much larger plan that God wants to accomplish through us. This is true for us individually and for the church. Do you realize that it's not just about us coming into the family, but it's about us coming into the family, belonging to family, so that now the light and glory of Christ that I was talking about in the beginning of this message would shine to a world that longs for family. Do you realize the problem out there isn't the politics, by the way? It's an orphaned world. <laughs> Vote biblically. Yes, I said that last week. But the real issue is well, the world is bankrupt. It's got to devoid the size and the heart of humanity, the size of Texas. It's bankrupt. It's looking for love in all the wrong places. Only Jesus can fill the ache in the heart of humanity. Amen. And the church is his answer. Amen. I know we're not perfect. But he says, church, I already see you as glorious. So just start acting like it. Love one another. Love them and go out there and be my light in the midst of the darkness. Sure, God cares deeply for each of us but he's working through us to help redeem all of humanity. There's a hidden story here. I like uh, this backdrop. You know, Paul was a learned Hebrew scholar, and there's a backdrop here to what he's talking about, and that story is that of the exodus out of Egypt with the children of Israel. In fact, down further in Ephesians 1 here, verse 10 says he would gather together all in one. I like what... Anglican bishop and author, scholar N.T. Wright says, he said, God chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be the bearers of his promised salvation for the world, the rescue of the whole cosmos, humankind especially, from the sin and death that had come uh, through, the, through rebellion. And he goes on to say, when Paul says that God chose us in Christ, the us here being the whole company of Christian Jews and Gentiles alike. He is saying that those who believe in Jesus are now part of the fulfillment of that ancient purpose. In other words, what he's saying is, listen, it's not a predetermined few. The, the all of us are those who finally say yes, and we're going to say, okay, we want to be part of this exodus out of the world, Jesus. You lead us on into the new promised land. Are you with me? He chose us in Christ to be part of this great company of believers. Jews and Gentiles alike throughout the ages of history. In verse 5, let's talk about a little bit more about adoption. God decided in advance to adopt us. You see, your adoption liberates you from bondage to and fear of the law. Probably one of the greatest things for, for me as a pastor is when I see people get a revelation of this. They no longer have to fear punishment or fear judgment because they've been liberated by the perfect law of liberty, and that is Jesus Christ. And they realize in him they are completely free, loved, and accepted, and forgiven. Paul explains in Romans 8.15, let me read that. Again, that we don't have to be afraid of God as if he were a slave master. So Paul says, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And the Greek literally means a spirit of sonship, that you received a spirit of sonship when he adopted you. Now we call him Abba, or in the Aramaic, that's daddy or papa, father. It's tender. It's intimate. My grandson burst in my, into my office there yesterday, and, you know, and, and I was at home, and he's two and a half, and he burst in, and he goes, Papa. My heart just melts. Listen, the Father loves us, and the Father wants that type of intimate relationship with each of us. Abba, Father, Papa, Daddy. Yeah, we should have a reverential love and fear of the Lord, yes, but not fear of judgment. 
an understanding that he accepts us just as we are. So later, you know, we brought in some pomegranates here last week. We had this big pomegranate tree in our, our yard. So we're, we're still unpacking some of these pomegranates. And so we're in the kitchen and Carolyn's making some lunch and I'm doing a pomegranate with my grandson. I love it. And pomegranates are a little messy. Have you noticed that when you take them apart, seeds are going everywhere. These things are so juicy. They're so good. And we're going, so David's helping me. He's taking some pomegranates. He's putting them in my mouth, you know. And at one point, after a few minutes of this, you know, he's two and a half. Have you ever noticed two and a half year olds can get a little bored some, sometimes? Some of you aren't sure yet. Okay, you <laughs> believe me. And so all of a sudden, after getting a bunch of the pomegranates in this nice bowl, and they look so good, and we're taking, I'm taking a few and eating them as we go along, and he's taking some, you know. All of a sudden, he puts them in his mouth, and he goes, Pff. Carolyn takes the bowl of pomegranates, begins to wash them, drain them out, you know. I go, now, David, we eat the pomegranates. We tend not to spit them back into the bowl, amen, okay? Here's the point. A loving father, my kid, grandfather, I'm not angry at him. It's like he's two and a half. He's going he's gonna to make a mistake. He's excited, right? He, it's no big deal. Listen, the father is not upset with your messes. Pastor, are you saying we should? No, 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 don't sin. I'm just saying if you make a mistake, run back into the Father's arms. He's not standing there looking to judge you. Yeah. Rather love you and pick you up and draw you close and say, listen, let's, let's go higher. Come on, let's go higher. Let's go higher. You see, you've been placed, you and I have been placed in God's family. You have the full rights of his family complete with his unconditional love. In Christ, you are no longer an orphan a black sheep, or from a broken family lineage. Some of you have come from some pretty broken homes. I came from one. Rather, you are loved, adopted, and empowered child of God. This is, I love this. And Paul was writing when he wrote, this, especially through that Romans passage there, under Roman law, this is very interesting. If a, an indentured servant or slave was adopted by you know, a Roman citizen, that slave now had all the legal rights that a natural son or daughter would have in that family. So that slave then, he goes, that's why Paul's saying, you're no longer a fearful slave. Listen, that slave would be brought in, they would have all of the same rights and privilege that a child would, a natural child would. And interestingly enough, a natural child could be disinherited under Roman law, but not a slave who had been adopted. They could never be disinherited again. And so Paul is writing from that backdrop there in that Romans passage. And again, it, it ties in there with what we just read in Ephesians as well. He also mentions it in Galatians. And so listen, it's amazing. You have been adopted. You don't have to be a fearful slave. God is not going to disinherit you. Maybe if you spit out some pomegranate seeds in the bowl, okay? Whatever your mess is, run back into the Father's arms. You're legitimate. No longer a slave or an orphan. Likewise, when we became a Christian, we gained all the privileges of being a child in God's family. But wait a minute, Pastor. I didn't, I didn't come from a great home. I didn't, you know, listen... God's already determined. He made a plan, but he knows the purpose for which he's created you, and you're the only you. And it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter the situations, your life. Those things can hinder maybe the call, the purpose in our life. But when we awaken to our destiny and purpose in Christ, we can begin to rise and live above that and become everything that he said that we are. Amen? Amen? Your adoption into God's family has given you the privilege to live as an heir of God. And his joint heir with Christ in the inheritance of the Father's house. Again, think how big that is. To be an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Listen, this is scandalous. He has taken us out of some pretty wayward places. Even if we came from good homes, our homes weren't perfect. And he has put us in his family, his lineage. We can never be forsaken, not for the moment. And now we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. This is amazing. All of heaven is behind us to be successful in this life and to make a difference in this world. Through our union with Jesus, you can claim with confidence your inheritance as his child and the rights to God's promises and resources. God's love for you is complete. Again, nothing 
will separate you from his love, and you can find, it, and find security in that. You don't have to strive to earn his love or acceptance. You need to love yourself as much as God loves you. I've had the opportunity to go, and Carolyn and I, to some different orphanages in different places around the world. And there's one common theme that you see amongst orphans. And we first, I, I think one of the most dramatic moments for us when I first realized this was we were in Romania in the early 90s, right after communism fell. And there was a leader in Romania under the communist rule, and he was in tied close with the Kremlin there in, in, uh, in Russia, and uh, Ceausescu. And so he had this grand vision he was going to create a state workforce. He was requiring women to have lots of children. I'll say it like that. And so um, it, was, it was bad. So women were having children impregnated, forced in some cases, or state-run orphanages. These kids never had time to even be with their natural mothers. They were like, women were just becoming like baby machines, boom, just, just having kids. These kids were taken, put in the state-run orphanage. He was going to create a workforce. This is what communism does, folks. And so these kids, and we went to a couple of orphanages, I'll never forget. And, and psychologists, and they've proven this, that without that interaction with the mother, without parents, and all of a sudden, they, these kids, they don't, they don't know how to relate to others. There's not trust there. Basic trust is developed usually in the first few months of life for all of us as individuals. And so these kids, it was one of the saddest things. You could see this hollow look in these two-year-olds' eyes, these three-year-olds' eyes. They would, sometimes the workers say they would just cry for hours and hours in their cribs. But here's the other thing about orphans. Was they get older because the basic trust is not there and there's not this sense of acceptance and, and love they strive for acceptance. They strive to be loved. And so oftentimes we see this play out as pastors and counselors. We see sometimes, even in the body of Christ, people come in, if you come from really broken family situations or, or circumstances you've been through in life, if, the, if that a revelation of the Father's love and how loved you are, how accepted you are, and the, and the wounds and traumas of the past haven't maybe been ministered to or brought to the cross and allow God's healing to take place there, there can be a striving for love and acceptance even in healthy church bodies amongst people. And so we want to help people come to a place where they understand how much Jesus died for us, how complete that victory is, and how secure we can be in him. Does this make sense? We don't have to fear God ever. But you see, if you believe God's angry with you, if you believe God is just looking to judge the world, You've not yet matured in your understanding of his love towards you or in your relationship with him. You know, God, his words towards us are words of affirmation, not condemnation. He wants to build us up, and he wants to set us free from the pain of the past. I like what the writer John writes in 1 John 4, 17 and 19. Let's talk about this thing of being free of fear of punishment. John says this, this is how love has been perfected. Don't you want perfected love in your heart? This is how love has been perfected in us so that we can have confidence on the judgment day. Now, what's he talking about in this passage? The judgment day. What, what's the judgment day? When the earth shall be swallowed up, right? And we're all there in the presence of Christ, right? So this is where you can have confidence on the judgment day because love has been perfected. He goes on to say, because we are exactly the same as God is in this world. This is one of the most scandalous statements in the gospel. That we are the same as God is. I'm not saying we are little gods. I am saying as he is, so are we. Perfectly loved. The Jesus is perfectly loved, accepted, would never be abandoned by the Father. And so are you and I. You've been adopted by God. And you are seen as Jesus is by the Father. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear expects punishment. You see, orphan thinking or hearts that haven't been fully ravished by the love of the Father and understanding this adoption, we fear punishment. 
The person who is afraid has not been made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. You see, fear expects. Fear expects punishment, whether it's on judgment day. But see, fear will also cause us behavior patterns that we may even control around us because we don't want punishment or exposure or someone finding out we're not perfect. And newsflash, none of us are perfect. None of us. And so... Fear, there can be these cycles of behavior. Fear will cause us to control. Maybe it's because of shame. Maybe it's because of trauma. Maybe it's because of something horrific, you know, that's happened. Whatever it is. And so it, it begins to cause us to control so that we can know the outcome because we don't want the possibility of being punished or we think something could happen. Does that make sense? God's complete acceptance provides confidence that in the presence of God, you are fear, uh, free from the fear of judgment due to your past or present mistakes. As believers, we're disciplined, but as parental fatherly discipline, you can go look at this later at Hebrews 12, five, verses 5 through 11. The shaping of your life by God so that you mature as a son or daughter shows you are generally born of God. He is your father. God's grace is limitless, but the transformative nature of his grace spurns you to live a holy life. So he wants us to... To, to get fatherly discipline and mature and grow, but it's not out of harsh condemnation or the fear of judgment. And so I allow the Holy Spirit to convict me in where I need to make changes in my life, but I don't fear punishment. I don't fear the Father. Does this make sense? It liberates us. And when we begin to operate in that type of liberty, we can begin to impact the world around us because we're confident in the love of Christ. And they begin to see that love of Christ, the confidence in us and his love. Does this make sense? Again, this passage in John doesn't relate to fear of punish, uh, judgment for sin. Christ removed the eternal consequences of sin. But listen, if you're not in Christ, there is fear of judgment. But the Father's desire is to release and reveal his mercy because mercy triumphs over judgment. The Father's desire is for the world to realize, listen, you don't have to fear judgment. Jesus, my son, paid it all. Just give your life to him. Let him ravish your life. And then we can live free of the fear of judgment. But those who have never really given their life to Christ, they live in this fear. Fear of the world, fear of what's going on. What's happening? You see, it's not about fear of the eternal consequences of sin, nor is it about character development. It refers to your position as a child in God's kingdom. I'm almost done for today. Verse 17 of the New King James reads, As he is, so are we in this world. The Father completely loves and accepts Jesus, and so are you and I. In verse 18, the English word fear is translated from the Greek word phobos, which denotes both the fear of terror and the reverential fear of God. We are to reverentially fear and honor God, but not fear the terror of punishment, which was removed in Christ. So living in Christ, you are secure. In Christ, you are secure, church. We were created for family, specifically to be part of God's family. Knowing God personally as father and belonging to family they're not incidentals in God's kingdom. They're the reason that Jesus died for us. We have a void that's in our heart that only he can fill. And so, uh, and, and Jesus wants us to fill that void and he wants to adopt us into his family. We'll try all kinds of counterfeits to fill the void. I mentioned some at the beginning of the message today, but only Jesus can. Our new life in Christ doesn't end with an individual salvation experience. Rather, the fullness of salvation is realized in God's family with other members. Real life and real joy are found in God and his family. And so that's the thing that it's important for us to realize. It's not just about our individual salvation experience. Our salvation is being wrought out in the church, being brought about. Following Jesus, as I shared a few weeks ago, means more than just believing. It means belonging. It means to participate in the local church body, to be a contributing member in God's family. And Ephesians 2.19 in the Living Bible says, Now you are no longer strangers to God and foreigners to heaven. You are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and you belong in God's household 
with every other Christian. Listen, folks, you belong here. You belong in God's house. Whether it's this local church body or a good local church body somewhere, you belong and you're part of the eternal church. You don't ever have to fear rejection. You don't ever have to fear. You don't have to fear correction. Do you realize healthy correction through healthy leaders is a good thing? We should be accountable to one another, and we should love people well enough to know that we can share and, and, and know when we can and those kind of things. But we shouldn't fear correction either. But, but listen, you know, when we're, we're not maybe there yet in our hearts, you know, and fully ravished by his love and knowing how accepted we are, we may, we may fear those things. But God wants us to grow and mature such that we can not fear him or fear one another as we go in this journey together uh, in the body of Christ. Would you go ahead and stand? This is one of my favorite messages to preach about the Father's love and his adoption for us. And so I pray if you're here today and you don't know this wonderful Jesus and have never really been ravished by his love in such a deep way that you know that you're completely loved and accepted, I pray today he would say yes and say, God, Lord, just fill me with your love. Take that void out of my heart. And it may be the beginning of a journey for you. There may be some more ministry you need down the road to, to get free of some of the pain of the past. And I've shared that, uh, you know, a month ago as I went through some, a series on developing positive thoughts and emotions. You may need some others to pray with you to help get free of some of those things of the past. But the bottom line is you're completely loved, accepted, and forgiven in Christ. Amen? Amen. He wants to adopt us and wants us to know the fullness of that adoption. So, Father, I pray today. I pray for your church body. I pray if there's any here that don't fully know. And what I sense in the Holy Spirit is some of you, you've got some real pain, even from family situations that you're dealing with. God, this is sort of the beginning, even this fall season as we're getting ready to go into the holidays, God wants to heal that. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking, take even some of the words I shared today and start the process or accelerate the process. And the Lord just wants me to write. Some of you, it's like an onion. onion. God's going to take a layer or two off at a time. May give it a little rest. He may take another layer or two. Just stick with the process. Let God minister. Some of you may be, well, listen, I got some ministry in this area. Now, I don't know, that was a couple years. And all of a sudden, stuff's coming back up again. Let let him cape. You know, the thing about onions, if you start working with an onion, sometimes you cry a little bit. Just let the process. The Father knows. The Father wants to go deep. I just feel, I mean, this is like, I, if I, this is like a neon word of knowledge for some of you right now. I hear the Lord saying, I want to go deeper in your life than what you've ever experienced. He's making his bride ready for something glorious. Church, Father, I pray right now. For those that that word applies to, whether it's forgiveness issue, pains, traumas, abandonment, rejection, I pray, God, you would come and you would heal that and minister to that in the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now listen, go love on one another. I know there's a little deep here at the end. And let Jesus do his work. But realize that part of that work is going to happen through healthy body relationships. So spend some time with one another, all right? That's why we do these festivals like this. Spend some time if you can stay after. I know some of you have to leave. But listen, stay. Get to know one another better because healing, iron sharpens iron. And there's something in the relationships that we have that does a deeper work and God uses it. Amen?